Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Tom Standage, who is business editor of The Economist. His interest in how economics interacts with the larger forces of history is apparent in his latest book, An Edible History of Humanity. It's a book which, as the new scientist put it, is not so much about what changes in food throughout history, but rather what food changes. I spoke to Tom on the phone and asked him first what, amid the plethora of books about food, he was trying to do which was different. Well, I wanted to know which food should have the most influence on history and how. And there are lots of books that tell you about the influence of history on food. So, you know, Columbus goes to the Americas and then Europeans can eat potatoes or Italians sometimes you know, suddenly get tomatoes and polenta. So there are lots of books that do it that way around, how the history drives the cuisine. There are also lots of books that focus on a particular ingredient and its you know, impact on different aspects of history. Yeah. And I really wanted to sort of step back from that and say, what were the big changes that different foodstuffs brought about and how? And so that's what I'm looking at. And so I ended up with six ways in which food had influenced the course of history and there are different foods sort of hero foods mm. in the six sections that are part of that but that was really the big question what were the the uh, ways in which food had made the biggest difference to human history and one idea which comes across very early on in the book and persists throughout really is this notion that that there's very little that is actually natural about what we eat yeah. today almost nothing that we eat is natural actually yes if you get into a um time machine if you had one and you went back 25,000 years then you wouldn't find any chickens and you wouldn't find any corn and you wouldn't find you know nearly all of what we eat obviously there are a few wild foods fish berries nuts things like that that are things you would find in nature if that's how you define natural and i think that's a reasonable definition of natural i think the the point is that we forget just how engineered the plants and animals that we eat are and the landscapes in which we grow them so we'd like to think in britain in particular of you know, the country landscape as a sort of state of nature with the, the sheep and the cows and the, and the wheat and so on. And in fact, you know, the natural state of the British landscape would have been forests of oak with wild boars running around. Mm. Those animals have been introduced from elsewhere. The crops have been introduced from elsewhere. And it's a completely man-made landscape just as much as, you know, the skyline of London. And I suppose many of us might have grown up with the notion that the transition from hunter-gatherer societies to agricultural societies was one of the sort of great achievements of, of humankind. And you, you sort of put that, that notion uh, into question too. Yes, I mean, it, it was in the sense that um, switching to farming makes civilization possible. So civilization, as we know, it is based on settled society. And you can't do all of the things that we associate with civilization. You have cities and complex societies and complex economies and specialization in particular activities and development of technology all this kind of stuff isn't doable with nomadic lifestyle you haven't got the surplus of food that allows people to not have to worry about where their food's going to come from and concentrate on other things and agriculture makes that possible so in a sense you know we are beneficiaries of this obviously but at the same time if you look at how people's lives have been affected for most of history since Mankind started switching to agriculture about 10,000 years ago. Most people have been worse off. They've had to work harder. They've had a less nutritious diet. They've had a less balanced diet. They've had more disease. They've been shorter. It's only in mm. very recent history that people, in, and only in the richest parts of the world, have regained the stature of hunter-gatherers. If you look at early farmers living alongside hunter-gatherers, the um, farmers are invariably shorter, more diseased, have a less balanced diet, and are by most objective standards, worse off. Now, the thing they don't have to worry about is quite so much is where their next meal is going to come from because they've got a more secure food supply and they can support a larger population. So those are the advantages that they have over hunter-gatherers. But you have to ask yourself why you would switch from a rather more leisurely hunting and gathering lifestyle, which seems to have required about two days a week of work to actually procure enough food to live on. Why you would switch from that to farming is a mystery but there are advantages that come from it the ability to accumulate wealth the fact that you don't have to constantly move around to follow food sources and so forth which then give rise to to modern civilization so jared diamond has called this you know the biggest mistake in human history and we're very privileged those of us that live in the rich world that we have the advantages of civilization 
And we also don't have the drawbacks of farming. We don't have to be farmers. Farming has been industrialized so that only half a percent of people in Britain are farmers and the rest of us can do other things. Uh, and the definition of an industrialized country is that most people are farmers. So I personally um, benefit from the switch to farming in the sense that I have um, the benefits of civilization. And I also have a nice variety of food available to me. I can have a balanced and nutritious diet. I don't have to worry about disease and so on. But I'm right at the end of this 10,000 year process. And, uh, you know, half the world's population still hasn't come out of the end of that and are subsistence farmers and, and so on. So farming, you know, was it a mistake? Well, I think if you sort of mm. tot up the aggregate happiness of all the people in the past 10,000 years, you might actually say that it was. You mentioned some of the sort of physiological disbenefits of farming versus hunter-gatherers there, but it also brings up all sorts of things in the political sphere. So yeah. hierarchies, structures of power also, with their pluses and minuses, come along with, with agriculture. Yeah. So the ability to accumulate wealth, which comes with agriculture, because hunter-gatherers couldn't really accumulate wealth. They had to carry everything they owned around with them. And in fact, quite the opposite. Marx and Engels were inspired by hunter-gatherers that were documented by anthropologists in the 19th century and called them primitive communists because they had rules that have sort of enforced equality within a hunter-gatherer band. Essentially, if a band had a rule that you have to share your food and you have to share your tools, that band would be likely to outcompete other bands. Mm. Um, because they wouldn't all have to carry spears and nets and, and so forth. They could just share them, and there would be advantages to sharing. Uh, as soon as people settle down, though, they have the ability to accumulate wealth. Some of them are going to be better at farming than others, and you immediately see in the graves in early agricultural villages that some people are of higher status than others and it isn't long in the it's an eye blink in the grand mm. scheme of things it's just a few thousand years before you get the first great civilizations of uh, you know egypt and mesopotamia and india and china and then later on mesoamerica where you have an amazingly hierarchical society with a tiny elite on top of a, a priesthood on top of 80 percent of the population who are producing all the food and they come up with these strikingly similar religious justifications for exactly why it is you have to hand over the excess food to the uh, to the tax collectors but um yes ultimately the ability to accumulate wealth gives you inequality and that seems to be sort of inherent to um to the way uh, civilization works now if we leap forward several thousand years you you coined what i thought was a very nice phrase about the post-columbian era you said the post-columbian stirring of the global food pot was the, was the sort of second huge revolution in the way that that food and history interpenetrated each other can you say a bit about what was going on then yeah so agriculture is obviously the biggest one and then you have the rise of hierarchical societies you have the interconnection of these societies which happens through trade and i particularly look at spices and then the fourth of my six um things is looking at well so the the Columbian exchange led to a number of things clearly it meant that these new world crops that weren't known about in the old world crossed over to the old world so that was things like maize and potatoes tomatoes and so on but the most important are maize and potatoes because mm. they produce a lot more calories per acre mm. than than that's crops that were known about in the old world at the time so they spread amazingly quickly right the way around to china within a century and then other things went the other way. So uh, obviously lots of people, lots of disease, uh, lots of slaves were shipped over. But on the food front, probably the most striking thing right away was, uh, was sugarcane. And mm. sugarcane was the reason that slaves were taken from Africa to the New World because sugarcane, which is actually originally from the Pacific, it was brought round into Europe by the Arabs. It was then taken to islands off the west coast of Africa, which turned out to be a good place to grow sugar and were conveniently out of view because you need lots of slaves to do it. The, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese then set up, and then later Western, other Western powers set up colonies and uh, started to grow sugar in really large quantities, and they needed lots of slave labor to do that. And so that led to the slave trade and the triangular trades across, across the Atlantic. So that really did shape, change the demographics of the New World, obviously. It also changed the demographics of Africa, and it led to an even larger system of, of global trade, and countries like Britain you know, got very wealthy on the back of this, and this was the basis of British expansion and British sea power and so forth was... was to maintain these trading colonies and agricultural colonies abroad.